Hi, this is Nicholas Proctor from the University of South Australia. What I'd like to do over the next little while is, is talk to you about some key issues and considerations um, in relation to mental health and vulnerability for people who seek asylum to Australia, particularly those people who arrive as irregular maritime arrivals. I've been working in this area for about 14 years and over that time I've had um, a combination of grant funded and community engagement work. Um, so my disclosures in relation to this particular presentation um, are that I've received grant funding and sitting fees from a range of organisations and I hold membership um, with organisations and groups which um, since the 1990s has enabled me to inform and shape and contribute to public policy um, in this particular area. For today's presentation, um, I'll be expressing views that are very much my own. Um, they don't represent any of the organisations or groups that were named on the previous slide and the data that I will discuss in the presentation is from publicly available sources. But before I take a journey into the, the issues of mental health and vulnerability, I think it's really worthwhile just to pause for a moment and reflect upon our own college standards of practice and some of the values and drivers that sit within me and as a in my vocation of mental health nursing mental health nursing, academia and, and clinical practice, but also underpin um, my motivation and drive my independence in the way that I um, give opinion and make commentary on these issues. And it's really about believing in the value of partnerships and working collaboratively across agencies, states and jurisdictions. Um, but also acknowledging the importance of lived experience and the potential that exists within all people, particularly people who are um, extremely vulnerable and at risk. The college in its standards of practice also reminds us of the importance of human rights, um, particularly those in, that have been proclaimed by United Nations principles, but also human rights that are underpinned by our own national mental health standards and, and policy settings taking into account cross-cultural, transcultural um, uh, and diversity issues is incredibly important for um, our nation and our civil society. Collectively these are my drivers that give me um, the motivation, the independence um, and the positioning and the framing if you like to be able to talk about risk, vulnerability, mental health for people um, who seek asylum to Australia. So what I want to talk briefly about today um, are really some issues around mental deterioration, something that's very well documented uh, for this population of people. The way in which static dynamic risk factors, particularly the dynamic factor of uncertainty, living in limbo and the deep distress that's associated with that and the collateral effects of that impact upon not only mental health and wellbeing but the way in which relationships are shaped and formed. I'm also going to talk about a concept that I first started to develop um, about 15 years ago, uh, this local global nexus in mental health. And what I really mean by that is physically I'm here, but emotionally I'm over there. I'm thinking about another place which is thousands of kilometres away. And that has particular meaning for me in my explanatory model or the way in which I communicate my distress. I'll also be talking about contagion and cognitive constriction um, as two key aspects of the self-harm and suicidal mind. And I'll link that with Joyner's interpersonal theory of suicide to help us understand um, some of the issues in relation to um, self-harm and suicidal behaviour, particularly for people who are in health detention but also released from um, immigration detention. So there is a strong body of evidence um, that's peer reviewed, um, that's good science, that indicates poor health status of people in immigration detention and it's something that deteriorates over time. There is a positive association between how long a person is in detention 
and the onset of mental illness. Um, and that's probably around six months. Depending on the circumstances, I, I think there's potential for it to be um, more uh, rapid in onset, but six months is what we currently know to be the case in peer-reviewed evidence. We also have good evidence about mental health issues being across the lifespan, um, which raises a whole series of real ethical and moral challenges particularly for children being in held detention. Within that, anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress symptoms are commonly reported, not only in the literature, but in other uh, grey uh, peer-reviewed literature, but also grey literature. And we've certainly found that in some of the work that we've been doing here um, in South Australia. We also know that um, there is some evidence of improvement in mental health um, so the symptoms of mental illness and mental health and well-being generally shortly after release from detention. You might call that a honeymoon period, a period of release um, and, and so forth, but longitudinal results have indicated that that is a short-term phenomena, probably six to nine months, and the mental health impacts of uncertainty, um, difficulties in coping, um, individual capacity to navigate systems and processes upon release um, have all intersected with the negative mental health impacts of detention, which has left us with um, the evidence that these issues are ongoing and can be ongoing for many months and, and many years. So what are these issues? Well, um, as we know through a, a range of sources, mostly in the mainstream media, uh, and first-hand accounts of people who have um, been released from detention, and the most onerous would be uncertainty, um, delay, unknown circumstances of processing times. Um, people will benchmark um, against others um, on the boat that they arrived on um, about where they should be in their mind, in their construction of, of processing. Each case is different. Each case for protection, refugee status determination is different. And the timelines for um, seeking out that information um, will differ depending on the documentation that people have, um, the documentation that can be sourced from other places, um, and other aspects of the story. But that uncertainty joins up with another aspect of uncertainty, particularly with regard to family. Um, and we, we are hearing reports, um, stories of people who have um, lost relationships, um, disconnected from their wives, partners, children um, because of this uh, uncertainty um, around processing or reunification. All of this becomes so consuming um, and there's this overall perceived sense of injustice and it's amplified by a range of other factors um, in the social world. Visual textual reference, so Facebook, social media, um, to um, the life of other people who arrived prior to August 13, 2012. Um, powerful drivers to seek protection. So imagery, footage, photographic um, footage, uh, imagery of um, um, destruction, uh, suicidal, homicidal bombing, um, homeland violence, uncertainty, that sort of thing. And as I mentioned just briefly a moment ago, perceived inconsistencies in processing times by sequence of boat arrival or um, perceived inconsistencies in processing times by um, someone who that uh, asylum seeker is aware of who they believe has a, a very similar story to, to what they have. This leads to a deepening, what I call a deepening vague limbo, um, an intense local global nexus and it has um, physical and um, neurobiological consequences. Difficulties in sleeping, uh, concentration, communication, reduced app appetite, a sense of urgency to be able to get things done. Why aren't things happening for me? Um, and that um, sense of urgency is something they take more, people take more broadly to the social environment. Um, and that sense of injustice and being disassociated um, from the world around. Physically I'm here but mentally and emotionally I'm somewhere else. I'm over there where I've come from um, 
or I'm thinking very much about my family who are uh, perhaps um, in a transit country. The pressure of family expectations to speed up processing to get other family out um, is a significant driver of these kinds of um, difficulties that I'm describing right now. And within that, not having a solution, not having an answer, leads to a strain in, in the way in which a person will present and represent themselves to their family, particularly um, uh, who are waiting on news um, of, of that processing, that person's claims uh, being processed. And um, what may then happen is this false self, this artificial self being presented and represented um, where people may say, well, actually, I'm in Sydney and I'm just waiting. But in fact, that person's not in Sydney and not just waiting. Um, they're still being processed and they haven't left held detention. So this is something that I started to develop um, some 14 years ago, um, referenced there at the Local Global Nexus and Mental Health of Transnational Communities. That, pub that paper is still publicly available as one of the Hawke Institute working paper series. Prolonged uncertainty for people um, with a past history of trauma and existing mental health problems and mental illness impacts upon autobiographical memory. And there's been some work done with uh, Kosovo refugees in, in this regard where it was not uncommon for a psychological cluster of events that I've been describing to lead to inconsistencies in autobiographical memory and questions regarding not only the veracity of claims that are made for protection, but questions um, with regard to the veracity of um, presentation of mental health concerns um, and help seeking more generally. Um, that particular phenomena, um, not being uncommon and published in the scientific literature, opens up another series of deepening mental health concerns that leave people feeling subjectively boxed in. Um, and this sense of being harassed and unfairly treated, particularly in the refugee status determination process or where there may be a pause in processing where there is no processing and the possibility um, of removal or transfer to a third country. And it has a very real potential to lead to a phenomena of cognitive constriction. Um, and cognitive constriction, where that person feels very much boxed in, shut down from clinicians and well-being others. Cognitive constriction is something that is regarded in the field of suicidology, in particular, as one of the most dangerous aspects of the suicidal mind. It's something that um, David Jobes from the ASHI group um, has been writing about quite extensively, most recently in his publication, Engaging the Suicidal Patient. Really what happens here is that health professionals um, are confronted with a powerful and constricted logic, rigidity in thinking, um, a narrowing in focus, um, which is all part of the explanatory model, the way in which symptoms are presented, when, how and why help is sought, and what people consider to be a good outcome. The person is boxed in, um, and that can be seen, as I, as I said, um, in emotions, logic and perception. The idea here is to do whatever possible to counter the suicidal person's constriction of thought by attempting to increase the number of options, certainly beyond the two options, of having an ideal or perfect solution. I refugee status, I want my refugee status, this is why I'm here and I need to be with my family. And if I can't have that, I'm better off dead. And this very strong and powerful reduced or constricted logic around um, the, it's unsafe for me to go back. I can't return to where I've left because I will be killed. So I'm either going to die here or I'm going to die back there. Um, and this is a very powerful uh, and dangerous aspect of um, logic and, uh, and perception. And to illustrate this in some graphic detail, this concept. Um, here's an image from um, a website that's often referred to by ethnic Hazaras, people from Afghanistan. 
what we have here is a, a still image of um, a bombing in a um, in Quetta, in a in a square in Quetta, um, which um, people will automatically say, "Look, this is what I'm escaping. This is what I'm trying to leave. Yet this is what makes my return impossible. Um, it is impossible for me to return to this." And yet, in the background here, circled, um, we have um, a, a message there, a sponsored billboard message of don't travel by boat to Australia um, because of that perilous and unsafe, that very real possibility of, um, of dying um, as a consequence or during the, the boat journey. So what you have is um, a, this kind of picture where you will begin to see the mind of the person that uh, feels boxed in and simultaneously within close proximity to others in similar and sometimes worse state of, of mental deterioration. That cognitive constriction in feeling, emotion and log logic um, leaves that person with, a, with problem saturation where they are um, you know, really strongly um, you know, tightly held to um, I have really no option other than to, to get protection and if not, I'll die um, either here or back there. Physically I'm here, emotionally I'm over there and that's the flash forward to over there. And we saw this at the time of the riots on Christmas Island two years ago um, and there's been quite a lot of mainstream media and, and uh, other reporting of that closed, crowded, crammed living conditions where you have uncertainty um, and those static and dynamic risk factors all intersecting with hopelessness, futurelessness, despair um, and the contagion effects of that. So the underlying kind of assumption around contagion and suicidal behaviour really comes from the study of infectious diseases where suicidal or self-harming behaviour facilitates the occurrence of subsequent suicidal behaviour either directly or indirectly. And contagion is closely associated with the formation of suicide and self-harm clusters. And if we look at um, the 26 self-harm incidents involving children um, in Darwin that was reported uh, in the Melbourne Age on the 20th of February this year, um, and related to data between, collected between August 2010 and November 2011, um, we would define this as um, a point cluster where the direct or indirect exposure to people who are self-harming or have suicided or having known the victim personally, having heard about the event through word of mouth or via the media is, is, a, is a powerful determinant or driver um, uh, for subsequent behaviour. This is something that was discussed um, at length at our meeting of the um, Special Interest Group on Suicide and Self-Harm Clusters as part of the International Association for Suicide Prevention in Chennai um, late last year. There's also a, a very real danger, particularly through social and um, mainstream media and, and some blog sites, um, for the labelling and framing and dismissing of self-harm actions as simply acting out or playing up or putting on a show. This is a very dangerous and demeaning characterisation of, of self-harm. And my, in my point about this is that the attributions of manipulative motivation or superficial labelling, labelling of mental distress uh, or this kind of um, acting out of distress or inner turmoil um, may in fact underestimate risk. Um, it is not only insensitive, but it is also exposing clinicians and others who perhaps might adopt some of this thinking um, to um, risk themselves. And what we know is that self-harming behaviour in the form of self-soothing actions, tension release, or the acting out of inner turmoil, um, or suicidal behaviour with the intent to die possibility, both behaviours are associated with an increased risk of dying. We know that um, as uh, through our evidence base, but we also have this um, currently in New South Wales and South Australian suicide prevention clinical guidelines. Um, and I think this is a very important consideration um, when we begin to think about our responsiveness, our assessment and responsiveness 
to the needs of those people in, in psychological distress um, and the way in which we will access their understanding um, and what catches our ear and our eye and our senses really when engaging people um, to help us understand that more fully um, particularly for people who have a history of um, multiple suicide attempts and suicidal behaviours they themselves had a, have an elevated chronic risk of suicide. Um, to help us understand that, we can turn to um, join us into personal theory of suicide, um, where we have this um, acquired capability uh, which develops over time. So even if this is self-directed violence without the intent to die, people are still developing an acquired capability um, and habituating the pain and distress involved in dying uh, or exposure to others in pain or who um, demonstrate self-injury. Where does this take us as practitioners? Um, this is, if you like, the backstory, um, taking into account the explanatory model of people who arrive by boat and seek asylum what catches our eye and our ear and our senses really, which constitute our sight lines of understanding, um, the flight, the passage, the requirement for safety, migratory experiences, um, experiences of held detention, the expectations that we have of the Australian government, service providers, family members, people from the same ethnic group. But also, it takes into account this vulnerability consciousness this concept that I've been developing now um, over the last 12, 18 months takes into account our understanding of secondary personality and behaviour change, but behavioural disturbance. People who are really changing in the way in which they relate to other people um, through their response to these profound life difficulties. Coping with everyday family situations um, upon release from detention into the community. What that gives us is um, some insights into capability responsiveness. We need to think about vulnerability consciousness as the backstory and capability responsiveness. What gives us um, that insight into addressing or responding favourably to those in psychological distress? How we listen to the needs of people, um, our stakeholders, our clients, and modify and respond to protective factors where they can be favourably shifted and modified. Particularly hope, human connectedness and family. Um, capability responsiveness takes into account personhood and identity. Um, Recognising and respecting diversity within the community groups. Um, working with people to process the trauma beyond original events. Um, Recognising that trust is a fundamental requirement for mental stability um, and communicating and demonstrating our compassion and understanding um, when engaging with people with this kind of backstory. Our vulnerability consciousness is an imperative to help us rebuild, help that person rebuild the many lost months or years for their recovery. So through this process of the backstory, the needs and issues um, and through all of this uh, body of work since 1999, um, we, we can take our knowledge forward and think about the capability responsiveness, not only as individuals, um, but as, as, as organisations where we develop partnerships between government and non-government organisations to meet the needs of people who are refugee and are of refugee and asylum seeker background. This means a comprehensive approach to mental health promotion and suicide prevention. Um, and services such as these are most effective when they're coordinated, integrated, and supported by culturally competent, culturally sensitive collaboration across sectors and within the community. That draws my presentation to a close. Um, it reflects a body of work uh, since 1999. Um, it's not representative of any of the groups or organisations I belong to and the views expressed are very much my own. Thank you.